here's some of the things that we're going to talk about, not necessarily in this order, but here's some of the most often used tools that people will uh, use when, when editing photos. Brightness, contrast, sometimes you've got darker images or some that are too bright. And with some of the tools, you can try to make them look a little better. Uh, crop, take out areas that you don't necessarily want. Image size, I know somebody asked about that last week. So we're gonna talk about uh, how to make the actual file size smaller um, and also be able to save it. And that's, that comes down here. Um, you can save images specifically for the web, which will save a much smaller version of it since the web doesn't show the same level of detail that a print publication would. Um, you can save less information and still have it look good on the web and have it take up less space on the web. Uh, we'll talk about the clone tool and some layers. And pretty much, uh, I hope I've, I've got a few images um, to use that and we can I'll demonstrate these techniques um, as, as we mentioned last time if you have questions um, I'm more than happy to answer them as we go along just press your Q&A or whatever it is that you do to get Mary's attention um, and happy to answer whatever I can and if there's something that comes up while I'm working on one tool if it inspires a little sidetrack to another tool, we'll, we'll do that too. Okay, so, unless I'm, I did mess them up. Okay, um, this is, this may look familiar to you. This is an image you had last week of Bryce Canyon in uh, Utah. And I wanted to use it to show some of the adjustments that we can make. Um, we have over here uh, color adjustments we can do and I'll, I'll just show you some basics of what we can do here. I'm going to use um, an adjustment for hue. I'm and Dan, this is Pixelmator that you're using? Yes, I'm sorry, I was just, I just realizing as I do. This is Pixelmator. Um, I'm using Using this, it's on a Mac. It's a, it's a Mac app, Mac only app. Um, there was the Ashampoo um, version, uh, similar app for Windows. Um, everything that I'm showing you here is available on all of these apps at these levels. It may look a little different. It may be called something else. Um, I, I'm staying away from some of the ones that may be app specific. But the ones I'm showing you here, and this is Pixelmator, this is the one that's got a free trial, 30 days. I have about 23 days left now. Um, and then I believe it's uh, $30, either $25 or $30 for the full version. And Ashampoo has a free version. And you can also, when you get in there, if you want more effects than they offer in the free version, you can pay for more, which also I think is about $30. Uh, but yes, it's, this is Pixelmator, and this is a Mac-only app. So I'm going to play around a little bit here with making this look a little maybe darker or having the colors come out a little bit more. And in order to do that, um, and to kind of leave this image, the original image, the way it is, I'm going to make a duplicate of this layer. We talked a little bit about layers last week, and maybe you'll get an idea when I show you. I'm going to duplicate this layer, and you'll see it's, it looks exactly like the other one because it's a duplicate. The check marks here allow you to make one visible or not visible. Right now they're both visible, and I wanted to do that to, to show you a little bit about the effects, but also how you, one way that you can use layers. We're working on the copy, which is the upper of the two layers, and you can tell because when I click here, it tells me which layer, whatever I'm about to do, this is the layer that it's going to affect, and it's gonna leave the other one untouched. So I'm gonna work with the top one, I'm going to come up here to hue and I'm going to double click on it. 
And I'm just going to play around. This is saturation. This refers to how bold the colors are. And there's a little slider here. And I'm going to grab it and I'm going to make it more saturated. So you can see now it looks like I'm on the planet Mars. And just, just to show you the extreme, this is how you could get it to look. Going the other way, you can take it to the point where it's now a, a grayscale or black and white image. So this is a this is a touch up you might do if you have a nice shot, but for whatever reason, maybe you weren't the sunlight wasn't everything, you weren't in the exact right spot, or you just want it to be a little more saturated. And a lot of that is a matter of taste. There's no right level of saturation or, or wrong level. Um, here's brightness which is the overall brightness. It's not the amount of color, it's the overall brightness. So I'm going to leave it where it was at roughly at zero. And now I'm going to save this. But if you remember, I saved it on this layer. So now if I want to compare what I just did with what the original was, I can Make this level, make this layer go away, and there's my original image. And then I click on and off so I can compare. I can see which one I like best. Maybe I want to make some more changes to it. But that's, a, that's at least for me and, and for a lot of folks I, I know who use layers, that's one way to do it is to just be able to make changes and not worry that you're going to end up losing the original or you're going to have to undo 15 different things that you did. Um, and if you wanted, you could make a copy of this thing. So this layer, so you'd end up with, okay, here's what is good for saturation. Now I'm going to, I'm going to find something else to do. I'm going to invert the colors on this. And now we have a frozen tundra or something like that. Um, and then, you know, Here's what it looks like in the summer. And here's what it looks like in the winter. I'm just exaggerating just to make a point. Each one of these things is allows you to play with something without having to worry about damaging the original. And then once you decide, ah, you know what, I don't care about having it be frozen tundra, you can delete the layer and all you're deleting is that one layer and you still have the original, and the one layer that you are playing with. So that's that's a good use for layer. I'm going to show you some others as, as we go along. Um, Mary last week had mentioned to me about this little tree up here, this little branch, and, and how it would be nice to get rid of it. And I agree. And in order to do that, we're going to use the clone tool clone stamp tool, they call it. A clone is, is what you'll see in, in most apps. So we're going to do that. And you've got a little screen tip here saying click an area to define the clone source. Now this, depending on what you're doing, this is a little tricky. It's not hard, but you, you need to be careful about it because you want it to look as realistic as possible. So you want to clone from an area that's as close as possible to what you want to take out. Okay, you wouldn't clone it from here because then you'd have a dark sh shape and a different shape appearing in the middle. So I'm going to click as closely as I can here. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to slowly start to, and if you notice below where I am, it's a little pointer little cross telling me where I'm cloning from. And what you often do, uh, you do a little bit and then you go and redefine the point. Now on the Mac, I'm pressing the option key. On Windows, it's generally the alt key because they're usually the same thing. And I'm going to click to define it. And then I'm going to start again erasing and I'm just because I want to be as precise as possible I'm just going to keep 
trying to make it look as realistic as possible. And sometimes you go a little too far and that's what command Z is for or control Z, the old, the undo command. If only life had an undo command the way apps do. But anyway, there's, here I'm gonna go above this and get this area that I just seem to have missed a little bit. And maybe I'll do a little bit from up here because I'm running out of room down there. You can also, if you had a larger area that you wanted to clone, you can right click and make this brush bigger. That's pixels there, 50 pixels. So now, I can do a larger area all at once. Also, you can define what they call hardness. Um, it's sort of like if you're familiar with what an airbrush is, you can paint very thin, thin layers, or the longer you hold on it, the, the thicker that the, the paint will be. Um, and you can do the same thing here, here, just have it paint over it a little bit, and then gradually get thicker. Did I see a question come up, Mary? It was your perfect timing. It's as if you were mind reader because the question was about brush size. Oh, okay. <laughs> and was the question how to adjust the brush size? Or? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and it can go up to, I don't know exactly how much it can go up to, a thousand pixels. Um, so if you have a really thick area, I generally work maybe 15 to 20 because I'm usually, if I'm using it, it's for something that usually is fairly precise and I want it to try to, I mean, that's pretty close. I would go back if I, if I, if this were mine and I was keeping it for my collection or whatever, I would go back in a little more and I'd go over a little bit and then I'd say, all right, that's enough. Um, but the idea is that you don't really want to see any kind of smudges and I'm going to blow it up a little bit so you can see. Looks pretty good. You can't really see much trace of, of a branch or anything that looks maybe a little bit here. Hard to tell if that's light. Well, it just messed that up. Um, anyway, um, you can go as finely or as coarsely as you want in terms of, it really depends on what it is. You know, this is great if there's a, a glass of water there that you don't want, or um, I suppose if there's people there you don't want in the photo or whatever it is, but um, it's nice to be able to make things look as close as possible to the way you want. Now also you'll notice here, when I take off this layer, the branch is back because I only did it to the one layer. So that's a good way to see how it is. Okay. So that's a good example of layers and adjusting saturation and using the clone tool to remove. Um, you're actually, you're not only removing, you're also adding. Um, because what you're doing is, uh, let me show you there. Even though the net effect is to remove this tree branch, what you're doing is adding the material above it to here, which has the effect, if that makes sense. Um, so you're really, this, this is not an eraser, I guess. So what I'm trying to say is this is different from an eraser because it's just putting another image on top of what's here, even though the aim is to um, have that disappear. So for instance, I don't know how well this will work, but if I wanted to make these structures a little bit bigger, I could add some down here. And, uh, but again, everything is being added when you're using this tool. And it will stay, the little cross below where the brush is, will stay in the same position relative to 
the cursor as I go along. So if I say, copy, here's my clone source, and I'm going to do it up here, it's going to bring the trees from where the clone source is. It's not, and it's going to maintain that same, and this can, conf this can get confusing when you're doing this because you suddenly get into something that maybe you didn't want to have. I wanted trees and now I'm back in the rocks again. If that makes sense. Very handy tool. Um, not, it takes a little while to, to get used to it, but not that hard to do. And again, if you get to the point where you've done it, I, I, like, I tend to do things like this in small bursts, if you want to call it. Um, for instance, I'll go like this, and then I'll stop for a second, and then I'll go again. And the reason I do that, not only for precision, but if I get to a point where I mess something up at, at the very end, and I have to do Command Z to undo it, I don't want to have to go back and, and undo, you know, the whole length of this because I messed up at the end. If I do it in smaller groups, then all, I, all I'm going to lose is the last group I did, and all of these will still be there uh, because the undo will only apply to the last step I took. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about image size. Let's say I wanted to put this image on a website. Um, I don't know how much you know about web images versus print images. I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, the, the image that you see on the screen right now looks good on a web screen, because that's, that's where we're looking at it. Um, but it was originally a scan of a slide that I scanned at a very high resolution. Um, and the idea was that if I ever wanted to print it, or if I ever wanted to enlarge parts of it without showing the rest of it, I could blow it up without having it look all pixelated. Um, but if I were going to put this on a website, I would want to make it as small as possible in terms of file size. Uh, the reason being that anytime you go to a website, whether it's on your computer or your phone or your iPad or whatever you have, in order to see an image, that image has to get loaded from the website onto your individual device. And the, you want to try to make the image as small as possible so that it takes the least amount of time and the least amount of data for that image to get from the website to your device where you're actually going to be looking at it. And if it takes, you know, 10, 15 seconds for each large image to get there, um, someone, a lot of times people get impatient and they're not going to wait the whole time it takes to get a whole page loaded if everything is so slow. Um, so you want to get the image as small as possible for the medium that you're using it for. And in this case, that would be the web. So we're going to use a command, <coughs> excuse me, uh, image size under image. Most, again, most apps will, have, will call it this and have an image menu, but there might be, this is very similar, by the way, to Photoshop and Photoshop elements, if you ever plan to use either one of those. Now you can see the resolution on this is 240 dots per inch. The resolution of the web, uh, when you're looking at the web, most of you are gonna be looking at 72 dots per inch. That's just the standard of most screens. Some are 96, um, 72 is a, is a good level to shoot for. So all of this other information here is more than what your monitor needs in order to have this picture look good. And all it's doing is making a, is making the file too b bigger than it needs to be. Um, so I'm going to change the resolution to be 72. And I'm going to change the image size. I'm going to go with 1,000 pixels just because that's usually a good size on a website. And you'll notice that since I have it scaling proportionately here, 
when I change the width, it changes the height automatically, or if I did it the other way, it would change the width automatically, so that the image stays in proportion um, and it looks the way it should. So when I click OK, it's going to take a minute to think about it. Now it's going to shrink that down. I'm going to bring it back up to, this is now full size. This is 100% what it would look like if I put it on a website and you came and looked at it. This is how big it looks, but it looks fine. Um, it's now about probably a fifth of the size that it was in terms of image size. So it's not going to cause problems for your computer or your phone or your iPad in in how long it takes for it to get loaded and will increase the speed at which the whole page gets loaded so that you don't get impatient and go somewhere else. Now, if I want to save this to be used on the web, this particular app, Pixelmator, has a share menu. A lot of the apps have share menus. Every app, whether it's Windows or Mac, has a file menu, and they all put this in, in different places. In this case, it's share export for web. So export is a general, uh, we're saving it for print or other air, other ways. Um, this is for web. You can see also Facebook, Twitter, Flickr. It will save them in a good format for them and it may help you to connect to them as well. Um, so that, that that's pretty handy as well. But I'm gonna export this to the web. And up here, I hope you can see this, um, the quality. I'm gonna use this format as JPEG, which is a standard web format. This is a color for the background for any spots that might not be covered by um, image. And the image quality here allows you to be adjusted. Um, you can do maximum or low or anything in between. Some of that will come from experience and some of it will depend on the image. This image is, has fairly um, fine features in it. There's a lot of features here that I don't want to get lost. So I'm gonna do it at maximum. And it's still gonna be much smaller than it was before. Uh, then I'm going to come up here to next. And it's going to give me the option to name it. And since I already have one called Bryce, I'm going to do that here. And I'm going to click export. And now just to see what it looks like, I'm going to open it. And Looks a little different, but for the most part, I think it's pretty, it's pretty close. A little lighter. I might experiment next time because sometimes when you save things, it doesn't get exactly the way you want. Uh, a lot of it is from uh, trial and error, but I'd be happy putting this up on a website. Um, one of the things you find with web is that people who use Macs and people who use Windows don't always see exactly the same color or the same shading, depending on what what equipment they're using. And if it's on a phone, then certainly something like this or, or on an iPad is, is gonna be fine. Um, okay, but that's how, you, that's how you take an image, do some basic editing with it, and then save it for the web. Any questions on that so far? Uh, we'll use some of these techniques moving forward, but are there any questions on, on what we're doing or other things that might've popped up? I have a question for you. Sure. I was wondering about, um, say that you're sending something in and I say it can only be two megabytes or five megabytes or something. How do you see your file size or, or we saw with the resolution and everything is, is there a way to indicate file size? Right. It's um, a good question because uh, most places or, or a lot of apps show it. I'm going to go back to the finder here. Um, 
it's 853K, which would be well under your two megs. But there, sh there should be a place in here, and there probably is a place in here. Um, Must be properties or something. File info. Let's try that. File name, file size, image size. Why wouldn't it tell you? Why does it have a right, pixel height, pixel name? It's kind of odd that it doesn't have. <laughs> the the information I I don't know about that I'm sure there must be some setting and some reason why it doesn't have it in here um, but this would be where you would go to find it if this was in fact working which is uh, which is the best answer I can give you at the moment and I think that's good but I also think that being able to see it in my file management my file explorers works for me that's good yeah yeah it's there um, and there's probably even other ways in here but um, Bryce from class once you know name it the original Bryce that we were working at is 7.9 megs so we got it down to 853k or less than one megabyte and still having it look pretty close um, right to the original um, quality wasn't lost where, what's that the quality was not lost no the quality was not lost and we enhanced the uh, the saturation the colors and we really dropped the size considerably so that it would be easy to email or put on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you're going to put it or just put it on a website if you have a website that you were working on. So okay. there's, there is another question out there. Would you do the same thing for saving to an external drive? And I think if I'm reading it correctly, does that mean you don't have to use the export, you just do file save as? Yes, if you want, if if you're talking about saving this as an archive that, you know, you want to have as a backup, so that someday if you need it because your original gets lost or something, you'd want to save it as full size, um, and not, not compress it any more than it already is, um, so that you could then go and do other things with it. So file, um, save as. This has the Pixelmator format or because Pixelmator has its own format and you could also, or you could save it as JPEG, Photoshop, PDF, Ping, TIFF, or Hive, which is the new format that um, iPhones and, and iPads use. The newer Apple uses this format. So yes, you can save it and should save it in the best quality you can. I would even save it as Photoshop or Pixelmator because even high quality JPEG is still compressed somewhat. JPEG by definition is a compression, what they call a lossy format, meaning you will lose some information. Um, it's just a matter of how much you will lose. So I always save originals. I, I save it in Photoshop because not only do I have Photoshop, but like Mac um, preview app, or the Pixelmator app, or there are, and, and also the ver many of the various Windows graphic apps can open Photoshop apps. Um, so I save Photoshop, especially if you're going to have layers that you want to save, best to save it in Photoshop so that those layers get preserved as individual layers. And then when you go back to work on it, all the layers are there. Saving it as JPEG, let me just see if that's, before I say this, let me, uh, Make sure that's true. Right. See, when I saved this from class, the JPEG, it only saved one layer. It took the layers that were in the original and combined them into one layer to save it as JPEG. JPEG won't allow you to save it as individual layers. So that's a very long answer to your short question, but I, I would save any original as a Photoshop if you can and not do any compression or do as little compression on it as possible and then use that if you want to make a web version by doing what we just did which was sharing it save for the web and all that export for web 
but the one that you have on your external drive and hopefully a cloud backup. If you remember last week, we talked about having at least two backups of anything that's important to you and having them be in different places. Um, you could take a, even, you, I use a cloud backup just so I have access to it elsewhere if I need to, but you could also take a thumb drive and put it in a safe deposit box in a bank or if you have a friend who's got a safe in their house, put it there so that if yours, if something happens to yours and it gets damaged, you have something in another location that you could use. Okay. Um, so let's, let's work a little bit on retouching. Um, Mary had mentioned that a lot of people might be in, interested in that. If you have a lot of old family photos, um, some of them may not be in the best shape either because how they were taken or the fact that they're years old and have been stored who knows where. So this is an extreme example, but I thought it would be fun to do. Um, this is actually my grandfather, his graduation picture from middle school. Um, and I guess there was a time when you had to get dressed up and hold your diplomas and do the rest of that. Um, anyway, this is him here. Um, so I'm going to show a little bit about some of the things we do because, and chances are most of the photos you would work on might not be in as extremely poor condition as this one was, but you can use the general techniques and, and adjust as you need to. Um, first thing I'm going to do is crop this a little bit. I don't really need the old frame there. Um, so I'm going to go here to the crop tool when I find it. Here it is. And these icons, by the way, are pretty much universal. These are pretty similar to what you find in uh, Photoshop and the uh, shampoo and it, it's sort of industry standard. Some may make it a little different, but chances are your clone tool is going to look like this and your crop tool is going to look like this. So I'm just going to come across here and crop this because that's really all I'm going to be working with. So I've defined where the crop is. I can adjust it a little bit in or out. Take away some of that white there. I don't really need that. All right, that's good for now. And I'm going to hit my return key to say, and so now we're just working with this part of the image. And I think the first thing I want to do is make it a little easier to be edit, to edit some of this. So I want to have it a little clearer so I can see some of it, more of it. So I'm going to click up here on the effects and I'm just going to double click here on brightness. This allows me to do some basic adjustment of brightness and contrast. There are other things you can do that are more involved, but at this point I'm just going to try to get things looking a little bit easier. It's a little easier to work with and brighter, darker, yeah, I think that's probably good where it was to start with. So I might adjust this and probably would adjust this later. By the way, you can also type numbers in here. So if you wanted it just to be 50, you can do that. All right, uh, I cropped it. And now what I'm going to do is uh, start doing a little bit of what I call surgery on it. And I'm going to start with this spot down here. I'm going to use the clone tool that we used before. And I'm going to make it smaller, eh, 15. All right, we'll leave it at 15 for now. I'm going to click here. Now, this is going to be a little more precise than the other one was. And what I'm going to do, I'm hitting my command plus key, which is blowing up the image for me to work on it and see um, every app will have something like zoom in and zoom out. In this case on the Mac, it's command plus or command minus. Um, but you can, you know, you'll have something, whatever app, whatever platform, zoom in. Um, this lets you just work on 
an area and make it be precise because this is sort of this has a lot of different shades around it and i'm probably not going to be able to get an exact match since i don't know i don't even know what's there i assume it's just the same background looks like his hands are ending there so it, but i'm gonna you notice how it's a little lighter here and a little darker there and I want this to match as closely as possible. So I'm going to click here where it's darker. And I'm going to start painting it in. Now I picked up this white here, which looks doesn't look good. So now I'm going to reposition that. So that's gone. And then maybe I'll come in on this side. And again, notice that the cursor follows where the little the cross there, front, that, that's the area that it's actually drawing from, is the same, it stays the same distance from where I'm using the brush. Here it's a little darker up here. I'll come down here and it looks like I was about to hit his finger. So I don't want another finger in there, so I'm gonna reposition it down here. You kind of have to be looking at two things at the same time. But again, if you make a mistake, you go back, either you undo or you come here and say, no, I want this to be darker. So I'm gonna reposition it here. And, and I'll just, I'll do this quickly so we can just get an idea. That's called messing it up, which I did on purpose because I want you to see. Um, once you get one row painted, it's a little easier to paint additional ones. Because you don't have to be as precise. And each time you're seeing that click is I'm pressing down my option key, which is causing that dialogue to come up. And I'm just doing this here to finish this and then I'll show you a little bit of repair. So I would just, here I would, it's not supposed to be, there we are, okay. I'm just gonna actually each, I'm just clicking very slowly Just to sort of fix that up. Okay. Now, perfect. You never know I did anything. Um, uh, obviously, I would go back and, and work on that a little more and lighten it up. Um, but I, you get the basic idea. Um, if this was something that I was going to be doing for you and then that you were paying me to do it, I would spend more time and, and get more of the color from here, for example, and have it be a better match. This is where it gets tricky. So depending on what kind of image you're working with, it might take you a little bit of time. Um, here's some other things that are sim more simple all these little white dust spots. Um, that's relatively simple. I'm holding my option key. I'm clicking there to establish it. Now I'm gonna hold this over it, click once. Now that's gone. Uh, same thing up here and here. And it's just a matter of going around and finding all of them. I don't think, looks like he's got bolts coming out of his neck, but as far as I know, no, he didn't have those in real life, so that must be um, light of some kind. And you can just do this as long as you want, as long as you have patience and as long as you see. Some things aren't going to be as obvious, so you might not have to get rid of them. But I like to, if I'm going to go through and do some of them, I like to go through and do as many as I can gonna blow this up a little bit. Now you see here on the chin, I wanna be careful. 
Yeah, I have to see how that looks after it comes back down. Yeah. I don't know. I'd probably play with that a little bit more. This, this here is interesting. The creases from the photo over the years. I'm going to try making this a little smaller. He said, all right. Let's try 10. Oh, yeah, here we go. And I'm going to try copying near here, taking those out very slowly. And I'll do a little bit down here. And again, it's, I'm not fine tuning it at the moment, but I would be. But you get the idea, find something that you want to remove, get as close as possible to it. And then even just one click at a time if you have to, because some even though it's quicker to drag, sometimes it may not look as good. Um, So we removed some of the lines. And when you go back to what would be a normal viewing size, you don't really see as much of what I did, except down here. You don't really see the individual little imperfections in, in what we edited. Um, but, but it does look nicer. So if you have photos from your childhood or family or whatever, um, this little $30 program or others like it can really help it help you um, make these a little more viewable. And I'm gonna play around a little bit with levels, although that's more great. This would allow you, this allows you to um, do some things with light and it's a little more precise than contrast or brightness and allows you to make it a little nicer viewing. Okay, looks better than what it did before we started. Um, and, and if I was going to actually print this out or share with my family, I would do a lot more work on it. Um, but you get the general idea, the techniques of, of, we basically did cloning, we did brightness and contrast. Um, I would make it the image size. Again, this is a 200 DPI scan that I did, so I'd probably put this down to 1000 again. And here's what it looks like full size. Um, and then I could save this as web or I could just export it in general. And that would allow me to use any of these formats and decide which quality I want. Oh, here, here, the file size here, it's, Mary, this is telling you what the file size will be um, depending on what format you use. Don't know why it didn't say it on the other one, but it's seven megabytes if I save it as a full Photoshop and the PDF is two and a JPEG at the quality that it's at now is 42K. And as I take this up, you see as the quality goes up, the size of the file goes up as well. So it's always a matter of balance, uh, compromise, whatever you want to call it. Um, what's more important to you, the file size or the co overall quality? And it really depends on what the image is to begin with and where you're going to be putting the image. Um, if you're, again, if you're storing it for long term and an archive or family history, make it as large as you can. Make it a Photoshop if you can or a TIFF or something that isn't going to compress it as much. Um, but if you need it to share it on a quick Facebook post with your family, then um, JPEG and probably 50% would be fine. 
um, because there's, there's just limitations in what Facebook, Facebook is going to compress in any way anything you upload to Facebook, whether it's a video or, or a image, they're going to do their own compression to it so it takes up less space on their servers. Um, so you don't have to worry about fine tuning it too much because you're not going to see all that level of detail on that service or Twitter or even Instagram for that matter. I think that turned out that turned out great. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I, guess I would spend a lot more time on it, but this is the basics. Go ahead. What were you going to? I was just going to say, um, is there a way to do a side by side comparison? You showed us before with layers that you can go back and forth to what the original and you know, if you had, yes, had I thought to create a layer before, <laughs> before I did all this, um, I would have been able to, um, I can show you, I think I can open it because I haven't saved this yet. Yeah, there's what the original looks like. I can, and this is sort of side by, this is the best I can do with the screen limitation, but there's the original and there's what we did. That's um, good. So you guess you can see. And, I, and I, I would have, had I thought of it, do what I did with the Bryce, which was before I made all these changes, keep the original, make, make a duplicate layer and then work on the duplicate layer so that I always have the original for whatever reason. Um, I was also going to ask you if you had, um, now that you've done all that brightness and contrast, if you changed it to sepia, would it, um, how would it look? Let's find out. I'm just curious. There is a sepia in here. Uh, sepia. There it is. I think I liked it better the way you had it. Yeah, I think so too, personally. So putting in your effort sometimes is better than just uh, picking sepia or gray, black and white. Yeah, I think that's probably true in general, all if not, or if not most of the time. But it, it, the, the question you have is, is it, you know, what, what, are, what am I using this for? Is it okay to just slap a sepia thing on it because it's a picture of me now and I want to make it look like it was me 100 years ago? Or is it an actual old photo that I want to enhance? Um, and make look as good as possible, chances are you're going to want to do it by hand if you feel comfortable doing it. Um, and that's another reason to work on layers so that if you mess it up, you don't actually mess up your original image. But yeah, I think in general, you'll find that most filters are trying to take some overall ideal version of what sepia is, for example. Um, but that's not going to work for every image. It'll work for some, but not as well for others. It's certainly not a bad idea to try it first. If it looks the way you want, you save yourself a lot of effort. True. So I'm being a microphone hog, but we have a question. Um, when a person receives the photo that you send, can they make it full size? Full size? Um, no, well, they can make it larger, but it's going to make it look pixelated and not very good. Once you've made the smaller version, that's the size you really should be looking at it that size or smaller. Someone could make it bigger, but it's not gonna look very good once they start making it too big. That's why when you save it, you can save it in different formats. If you want someone else to be able to make it bigger, um, you can save it in a larger format, a larger size, and just, you know, whether it's email or however you get it to them, uh, get it to them in the size that you want them to be able to use it as. Um, but no, you don't have, you can make it bigger, but it's not going to look very good if you do. So, so uh, sorry to interrupt, but sorry. you showed us for web. How about just for email? Maybe that would help answer the question too. If okay. you want, wanted to send it through email. Um, I would share it. Well, here's something for mail. Let's see there you I, go. Here what it does. It might be, oh, it's opening my mail program. It's just putting it into an email, but it's not really what I want. Um, I would share it and export it, not for web. I would probably use a JPEG or a PDF because those types of files can be opened by just about anybody. Um, some people might not be able to view other ones. 
um, JPEG. And I'd probably put it as large as I could if I was sending it to email and I wanted them to have the full benefit of being able to make it large. I'd say JPEG, 1.2 megs, any, any email program is going to be able to handle that. If I was sending it to them so they could look at it on their iPhone, I would make it smaller. But if, it, if my intention was to have them look at it on their computer, um, then I would use as big as you could JPEG. And using Dropbox or Google Drive or some other format would allow you to send it as a larger file, maybe even than you Yes, email. yes. Once you, once you save it, it's just like any other picture on your desktop, and you can save it into Google Drive or Dropbox, whatever you normally use, it's just like any other image. All right, I had one other one I wanted to look at quickly, just to, uh, uh, to wait. Here it is. Um, just to show layers. Um, this sort of looks like my cat is sleeping underneath the roots of a tree. Um, but in fact, there's the tree. This layer here is a picture of my cat sleeping that I took elsewhere. Then I took a copy of some of the tree and pasted it into a separate layer so that putting them together, it sort of looks like she's sleeping in a hole under the tree. So it's another example of using layers to make different effects. You can switch the layers around if you want and have one be in front of the other, but then you lose the effect there. And you can also duplicate layers and have multiple cats sleeping. So that's really if you want to have some fun or you want to add some things. Um, layers are my favorite tool, so that's probably why we're spending a lot of time on it. But um, they're so handy either just to experiment or to put things there that aren't there or cover things up that are there, but then being able to do a little A, B comparison. Here's what it looks like before. Here's what it looks like after. Um, okay. I think that's pretty much all I have for the moment. Um, and we're at five of eight, so I guess that's good. Um, what, what other questions do people have? I'll give them a, ch a chance to ask questions um, while I'm asking one. Sure. The, you were talking about having layers behind. How can you tell which one is, um, is behind, I guess? Um, here, the order that, that they appear. Okay. Notice when I click on it, it highlights on the screen here. Also, I would, once I was doing this, I would double click here and I would say cat on left, which would help me to identify which one is which. And then I can, if I put it behind the background here, the cat disappears because the background layer is on top and the cat on the right is behind that whatever layer whatever order this is in determines where they will appear did that answer your question that's exactly what i needed to know yes thank you okay great anyone else okay either you're all asleep or you just had all, all your questions answered so it's good i i thank you all for coming. I hope this was helpful to you, the, the two classes that we had. Oh, there's a Q, Q and A, I see a one. Mm -hmm. It says, can you show the Apple editing? Apple editing. I am not sure what that means. Do you, do, um, do you mean the, um, the photos that comes with Mac? Let's see what she comes up. Let's see. Is 
And that's what comes standard, right? It's called. Um, it's called photos. photos. Let me just see if that's what. What's your right. Name? There's a Mac oh. app, and there's also a Windows app called Photos, and it does some of what we did here. Um, I don't have time to show it now, yeah. um, but a lot of the icons that it allows you to, a lot of the tools are similar to what we've been working with and ha even have the same icons. Um, the downside to those, both of those is they're more for organizing pictures, which is not to say that's not useful, um, but they don't give you a lot of tools to actually do the kinds of stuff that we're working with here. I think it's also um, she was, in she, she's asking about retouch. Is that um, is there a tool called retouch? Yes, there is a tool called retouch um, that allows you to try to um, change the, the shading or, or the color, um, try to get it to match the area around it. Um, I'll be honest, I have not used it in the Mac Photos app. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure exactly how it works, um, but it is, I assume it's similar to others where it lets you fix little problems. Um, something along the lines of the cloning that we were working on, um, but it allows you to just go into an area and maybe um, put, make it look more like it, like for instance with the cats here, this is sort of crude because you can sort of see that there's a line around them and they don't really belong there. They were photoshopped in. Um, so retouch might make it more that it would blend in here. Okay. But I'm sorry, I haven't worked a lot with that tool. And I really can't tell you more about that. Um, Dan, do you want to share your email information again? So if they, if they do think of something, they could ask you. Sure. Um, Right there. There it is. Dan at ContainerMedia.com. Um, by all means, if, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. If I don't know, I'll make up something that sounds good. So, um, no, I, I'll either answer it or tell you that I, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm happy to answer what questions I can. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks, everyone, for attending.